Media Microphone. Bucks. Good morning. We'll call this meeting of the Bucks County Commissioners April 17th, 2024 to order. I'd like to begin with the Pledge of Allegiance and our Director of Emergency Communications, John Guy, will lead us. get a little bit closer if that helps. Um, so we are, we have some presentations that we'll begin with and because this is the meeting that we always do, our employee recognition, I'd like to begin with that. Um, and we have three people who were able to make it today. And the first is Sharon DeSalvi. And is Sharon here? Come on up. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> okay. Uh, you are welcome to, they didn't put it, having been here for 20 years, you are certainly welcome to make some remarks, but we'd also like it if you'd come up and take a picture with us. <laughs> yeah, you got to wear it. You have to wear it. <laughs> I was not expecting the peanut gallery behind me, so that was a very big surprise. And the sash came from my second deputy, so I'd like to point out a shout out to Marsha Miller as well. <laughs> also 25 years. Oh, okay, and you're from the clerk of courts too, we should say that courts, too. Yep. All right, well thank you. Come on up and we'll take a picture. <laughs> Everybody's a critic. All right, get back around in the 26th. <laughs> this is a first. We haven't had this before. Yeah. Might they, be a new tradition. They followed me over here. I had no idea they were coming. <laughs> this is for you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turn around. You're turning around. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And our next person for 20 years is Amy, and I hope I'm saying it right, Miskovich? Yes. Okay. And she is from Domestic Relations. You are also welcome to say something, and then we'd like to take a picture with you. I didn't know we could speak anything, but thank you very much for recognizing my service to the county. It, it's a nice thing to serve the public and serve others. And I thank you very much for the recognition as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for serving. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for 40 years with our health department, Eudora Kilpatrick. Are you here, Eudora? Is she here? Nobody from the health department here either. Do you want to pick it up for her? All right. We will catch up with her another time. Thank you. And thank you for 40 years. Um, before we do our next two, I'd also like to say you're, it's not your eyes. We all do have blue on because it's Child Abuse Prevention Month. And... Um, we wanted you to remember that today. We will begin with National Therapy Animal Day, and Commissioner Harvey will read that proclamation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, National Therapy Animal Day uh, aims to recognize therapy dogs and other animals who partner with their handlers to bring comfort and healing to those in need. And whereas therapy animal teams play an essential role in improving human health and well-being by interacting with people of all ages in a variety of settings like hospitals, pediatric care units, schools, and assisted living facilities. And whereas scientific research shows that interacting with therapy animals can reduce stress, improve cardiovascular health, lower blood pressure, and decrease anxiety. And whereas organizations such as Honoria Wellness utilize therapy dogs to bring warmth and comfort to clients throughout therapy sessions. 
whereas therapy animals help create happier, healthier communities by providing physical and emotional benefits to those in need. Now, therefore, do we, the Board of Commissioners of Bucks County, hereby proclaim April 30th, 2024, as National Therapy Animal Day throughout the County of Bucks. We encourage all Bucks County residents to celebrate therapy animals and their handlers who volunteer their time and compassion to support our community. I would also add, certainly there are a lot of organizations like the one you have here uh, and others throughout Bucks County, if you're interested in helping, I'm sure they would not turn away a donation <laughs> if, you, uh, if you wanted to provide some support to them, so. Um. Thank you, and we have Trish McGarrigal here from Honoria Wellness. And we were hoping that Gertrude was here, but I couldn't say. <laughs> yes. Yay. Can you, do you want to use the microphone just so we can hear you? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm so excited that you guys are doing this. Obviously, you know the value. I ran into Colleen and met Colleen on the way in. The value of pet therapy, it's not just dogs. There's a bunch of animals that are used for pet therapy and helping people to heal and find comfort in some of the darkest parts of their life. So Gert's daddy dressed her today, so I'm pretty sure her harness is on backwards, so she's really <laughs> uncomfortable. She usually is very well behaved, but she's kind of wandering around. So I was super happy when Charlotte called and said that this was gonna be happening and super happy when she said, can you come and maybe speak for five minutes? And I said, oh, speaking's great, five minutes? We'll see. So I told her to like play the Oscar music to get me off the stage. So we're Honoria Wellness. Um, we're a small private practice in Ben Salem, PA. And um, we have offices where we see clients in person, but we also do a lot of telehealth. As everybody probably knows, the pandemic switched a lot of things remotely. So I don't know if I can go forward. So um, I already said this, small private practice, we're really small, which means we get to specialize and put our resources back into training ourselves as the staff, Gert is, is getting more training, and um, we can really seek further education and certifications and things that really um, will help our clients because at the center of everything is client care and client healing. Um, so love my work, love what I do, love my dogs. So how did these two end up together? If we go to the next slide, it was quite accidentally. When I was doing my internship in grad school, I had been a registered nurse. I went back to grad school when my little guys were wee ones. And um, my husband was going to the mountains with the boys for the weekend and I was gonna meet him up there Friday night. I had to work my internship, which was halfway up the turnpike. So I said to my supervisor, do you think I could bring Ginger in? Because then I won't have to go all the way back home and all the way back, like I can just, we can just get right on the turnpike here. And she said, yeah, I think that would be okay. So Ginger was such a natural and such a hit and everyone loved her so much that my supervisor said, can she come to work every day? And so Ginger became instantly a therapy animal. And she would, so here she is, she started as the family dog, she stayed the family dog, but she would go to work with me and you would say to Ginger, you wanna go to work? And she would run to the car. Um, we would use her, if you, you can go to the next slide, there's just different pictures of Gert at work. There she is, that's not Gert, Ginger, I'm sorry. So after my internship, a colleague and I started a private practice in Southern New Jersey, the Artemis Center for Guidance. In the beginning, it was just my colleague, Kate, myself, and Ginger. And we grew and expanded and spread. Um, and you know, all the while, Kate and myself and our clinicians are getting advanced training and I'm getting all these fancy letters and certifications and all that. But people would call the office and when the receptionist would pick up, they would say, I wanna schedule with the therapist that has ginger. And they're like, oh, that would be Trish McGarrigal. They're like, I don't care who the therapist is. I just wanna work with ginger. So Ginger really just kind of instantly lit up the room, provided comfort. We used her sort of as an assessment tool because she would come in and we would say the, fur the closer she sat to someone, the more distressed they were in. And one day I had a client that when they came in and sat down, Gert kind of plopped on their lap. And I said, so how are you doing today? And she said, I'm good, I'm fine. And I said, I 
you know, Ginger sang differently. And she said, I know, Ginger, you're right. And she started telling Ginger everything that was upsetting her. So Ginger provided that venue when she didn't have words to share with a person. Ginger made her feel safe and she hugged Ginger and she petted Ginger and she told Ginger what was happening and then we were able to process it on a therapeutic level. So um, that's the power that I've seen over and over of therapy dogs. So Ginger was 18 when she passed and she went to work at the Artemis Center for Guidance to the day before she died. So that's our Ginger at Artemis. Um, Artemis continued to expand, it's really big. I was the clinical director, which meant I was doing a lot of directing and supervising, and I missed client care. So this is Gert. Gert started at the Artemis Center for Guidance. So this is her, she kind of came in and took over the office. Everybody loved her, and there she is in a staff meeting. Um, kind of bored, I guess, but so that skirt at Artemis, and then we decided that we would come closer to home. It was a big commute to South Jersey, so we opened Honoria Wellness, Gert and I, which is an hour, an hour, 1.4 miles from our home, so we could walk to work on sunny days. All our clients from Jersey came over and saw us there in person, and it was wonderful. So you can go to the next slide if you want. So that's Honoria Wellness. Absolutely wonderful, that was the end of 2019. So everybody knows what happened then, right? If you wanna go to the next slide, the pandemic. Everything moved to telehealth. So I kinda have a little timeline here of Gert because she could hear the people's voices. She recognized them when we were doing telehealth, but she couldn't find them. She would sniff under the door. This is her looking out the window that way, looking out the window that way, laying on the couch, still looking. She even tried telehealth, that didn't work for her. Now she's laying on the couch, now she's sound asleep. So she was very, very not having this telehealth stuff. What we did do in the half empty office building is I would wear a mask and we would go around to the other offices and I would stand in the doorway and Gert would go in and talk to people and it was wonderful for her and wonderful for the people who half their office staff wasn't there, they were working in isolation and it just, again, showed the power that a fur, you know, furry little friend can bring in, in helping us through hard times. So that skirt with the pandemic. Um, there was something else I wanted to tell you about the pandemic. Um, oh, the thing that we, that we found out during the pandemic, because people were at home and they missed Gert, but they were bringing their own furry friends, whether their cat or their dog, onto their lap during telehealth sessions. And what happened, surprisingly, was that they were in the comfort of their own home with their own furry friend, and everyone's pet became a therapy pet. And especially people with trauma made tremendous progress at this time because they had never felt safer to go to those places that are really scary to go to that sometimes we need to revisit in order to do healing. So um, that was an amazing thing that we found out about telehealth. I mostly still do telehealth at this point, so Gert doesn't really work in the office, um, but we go around and we volunteer at um, veterans' homes and um, schools and that sort of thing, and Colleen and I talked about maybe doing some connection for volunteering there. So this is just, and you kind of already went over it, common populations that benefit from animal support, which is really everyone. Um, the research is catching up to what anybody that's ever loved an animal already knows is they make our lives better and they make us feel better when, when we're down. So medically compromised or ill people, the research shows that they help with medical, even medically, not just emotionally. Um, emotional pain and distress, children with learning challenges, very specifically to children with reading challenges. Children are very nervous if they know they can't read, to read even with a tutor or a reading specialist. When you bring a dog in, they don't feel judged at all by the dog, and the dog just looks at them with love and support, and so they become much more fluent in their reading just by having a dog next to them. Children with um, behavioral issues, children on the spectrum, dogs are great at grounding and regulating, um, infirmed, elderly, employees, staff, 
really everyone. So I know you already went over this. Um, studies show in facilities, it's not just the patients, it's the staff and the family members who are also there visiting that all laugh more, talk more, engage more. And I think you went over, these are the four types. I won't go through each of them. Um, the big distinction is that assistant working animals, they are ones that are protected by the federal laws by the ADA. And they are to meet a specific need of a person with a disability. So if a person has a seizure disorder, that dog may have a signal that alerts them you're about to have a seizure and the person is able to lie down or sit down and get to a safe place. If somebody has PTSD, um, especially with veterans, this has been so helpful that the dog can sense when a trigger's coming on or a flashback is coming on and they're trained to help that veteran ground um, and to get through that flashback or that moment. There you go. Um, so they are ADA protected, they are working dogs. Those are the dogs that will have do not pet on them because they are working and um, they're, they're there to meet the needs of that one specific person. All the other categories are, you know, Gert has a sign that says, please pet me. So <laughs> she's there for emotional support. So that's the only difference. A lot of people have emotional therapy dogs and they get letters from their doctor. Um, the only protection they have by law is through the Fair Housing Authority, which says that they can't be discriminated on, they can't be not allowed to rent a place or live in a place. They're, they get to bring their animal, but otherwise they need permission of wherever they're going to get in, not like an ADA protected service working dog. And that's it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for doing this. We're Thank you. We'll take excited. a quick picture and, um, with you up here, if that's all right, and we'll come see Gert. Let's take a picture. We're coming down. I forgot we're going down there. I can shake the dog's hand. And speaking of helpers, this is also telecommunicator week and we have all those people in the audience who answer your calls and are there to support you. So um, Commissioner De Girolamo has a proclamation and then John Geib and his staff will talk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, whereas emergencies that require police, fire or emergency medical services can occur at any time and in any location and the prompt response of first responders is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. The safety of our emergency service response community depends upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from individuals contacting the County of Bucks Emergency Communication Center. Public safety telecommunicators are the first contact the public has with emergency services providing a vital link for our first responders by monitoring their activity by radio, providing them with critical information, and ultimately ensuring public safety. Public safety telecommunicators of the County of Bucks have contributed substantially to the, the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. Bucks County Public Safety Dispatchers in 2023 adeptly handled more than 781,000 calls and dispatched police, fire, and emergency medical personnel to more than 547,000 requests for responses. 
our public safety telecommunicators have exhibited unceasing compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their duties as they guide callers reaching out for help in time of crisis. Now, therefore, do we, the Bucks County Board of Commissioners, proclaim April 14th to April 20th, 2024, as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week throughout Bucks County. In so doing, we honor the highly trained emergency communication experts whose professional diligence helps maintain the safety of our county, its residents, and visitors to our communities. Congratulations. Uh, thank you uh, for your support, your continued support, the opportunity to uh, offer a few words. Um, every year we try and focus on one specific aspect of what we do. Last year we talked about the training officers because we were in a very uh, extensive training program to bring our staffing back up, which is now up over 90%. Uh, which is way above what many of our counterparts uh, are experiencing. Um, this year, I, I would like to talk more about the health and wellness of our staff. Um, before I get to that, though, I just want to acknowledge two individuals here who may know this is coming, but may not. <laughs> um, our day-to-day -day routine in Emergency Communications Center is, is rarely routine. In just the first few months of 2024, we've navigated some very significant events. Um, and I want to acknowledge two individuals who went way above and beyond during those events. Todd Newman, who is our Deputy Director of Technology, and Patrick Duchesno, who is our CAD coordinator, um, spent 16 plus hours a day for 10 days straight working tirelessly to guide our entire team through that event. And there was a lot of people uh, involved with these two individuals, the, their knowledge and experience was invaluable, uh, and their dedication to the incident resolution was, was admirable. So thank you both for, for everything you did during that incident. <laughs> Pivoting topics now, um, I want to provide some information on the hashtag IAM911 uh, insignia that you see up on the screen. Uh, in August of 2016, the IM911 movement was born uh, for a nationwide social media effort to recognize and reclassify 911 telecommunicators or dispatchers as first responders. They're currently uh, classified um, in federal levels as, as clerical workers. This movement would open doors to provide benefits afforded to other first responders, uh, like health and wellness programs and treatment for PTSD. And if you're not aware, there is both a federal and a state uh, movement right now. Uh, the state uh, currently has uh, House Bill 1463 introduced by Representative Jessica Benham of Allegheny County, and that's currently under consideration on the House floor before it, it moves to the Senate. Um, in the U.S. House, there's federal legislation reintroduced. They've tried this a number of times. House Resolution 6319 is a bipartisan House bill uh, that is sponsored by Norma Torres of California, who herself is a former dispatcher, and our very own Brian Fitzpatrick um, of Bucks County. So these bills are a direct result of that eight-year effort of the hashtag IM911 effort. The individual that created and started that movement, his name is uh, Ricardo Martinez, also a former dispatcher who went on to work in the private industry with a company that directly supports the 911 community. He also runs a uh, dispatcher-focused podcast called Within the, Trench Within the Trenches. And though the movement started as a focus on the reclassification effort, it became a gathering point for dispatchers nationwide to tell their stories and find other people who have walked in their shoes and handled similar situations. As a result of this gathering together and storytelling, Ricardo published a book titled Imagine Listening, Your Worst Day is Our Every Day. 
It was created around short stories, a couple sentences to a paragraph, uh, submitted by dispatchers across the nation from some of the toughest calls they've handled. And it's been a long time since uh, I wore the headset, but when I started to read that book, the memories started flooding back um, as I read the book. And I found it therapeutic, however, to know that others have handled and struggled with the same type of calls I've heard. And I wanna just give you some ideas of the stories that are in here. Again, they're very short. Um, I tried to go with ones that aren't too, uh, too descriptive. Um, this one says, I listened to your broken voice as you found your bride of 50 years collapsed on the bathroom floor. The same month I lost my own grandmother, we got through 600 compressions together. Your voice is still with me. I gave you instructions to control your unconscious mother's airway when her blood sugar dropped. You were seven years old. You did a fantastic job. Margaret, you couldn't breathe and asked me to stay because you were scared. I was with you while you took your last breaths. I cried. You and many others lived on in my thoughts and will never leave. And then there was one that was actually submitted by someone who called 911. And it says, I'm alive today because of a 911 dispatcher. She spent a good amount of time talking to me about life. And after a while, I put the gun down. I would have committed suicide if not for her. So after reading this book, I offered a few copies to our staff. We have copies in, the, uh, in our office if anybody would want one. And asked if anybody else would want to submit their story. And we did receive a few. Um, I brought some of the shorter ones, again, for time and purposes. Um, but here's just an example of some of the ones that were submitted to, from our dispatchers in Bucks County. He knew you. He was family, but he still treated you that way. Assaulted and stabbed, left for dead, your mom found you and called me for help. We were there with you. In your excruciating pain, you were never alone. I never met you, but I will never forget you. Uh, another one, I'm just going to read the, the very end of the impact. I'm not going to get into the details of the call that they're describing. And it says, I, recently being a new mom, felt that mother's cries in my core. And I had a new form of fear, emotion, and sadness for, as a mom for the very first time. You were a curious and happy child. Just arriving home with your mom, she quickly ran across the street to grab the mail. And your curiosity prompted you to follow her. The neighbor returning home didn't see you until it was too late. I heard your mother's screaming and pleading for you to wake up, and then realizing when you were gone, she began to tell you how much she loves you. I still hear that crying when it's quiet. We have a lot of new faces uh, on our team. Uh, many don't come from the emergency services background, so the shock of handling some of these tragic situations is, is very real. Uh, I so admire those who are willing to submit their stories and be vulnerable in service and mentorship to those newer teammates. When I invited the members of our team to submit their story, I ended the offer with this. Even those of us who have been around the block, we are not immune. We are first responders. The incidents we are charged to manage can impact us the same way they impact a law enforcement officer, a medic, a firefighter. I hope reading these short stories helps you to connect to the larger 911 community. And if you needed a chance to heal from calls, you have carried yourself. This is a hard job. Most could not do what you do. But even the strongest are still human. Look out for each other and be self-aware of signs that you need help. I don't want this to sound too cliche, 
but it is okay not to be okay. You are an important member of this team. We could not do what we do without each of you. Your well-being is vitally important to us and to me. Thank you for recognizing our wonderful staff, um, our professionals that handle our calls every day. We will display that proclamation very proudly as we go through celebrating this week um, our, our staff. Thank you. Please do come up. I don't think we could say much more powerful than what you said, but thank you. You certainly are the unsung, unsung and unseen heroes, and we thank you for all that you absorb every day. Congratulations. You, you have to get close to each other, though. <laughs> Pretend you like each other. <laughs> like a team. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Take you. good care of yourselves this week. Thank you. But quickly, before we do public comment, we do have our 40-year employee is here. And I may have had the wrong department. I said you, Doria Kilpatrick, and I think I said health department. Is that incorrect? Well, Eudoria, come on up. We have something for you. And if you have anything you'd like to say, you're welcome to do that as well. If you'd like to speak, you can right into the microphone. Thank you. Good day to everyone. Um, I worked at the Shaman for 40 years. And can I say what's in my heart? Sure. I guess when I started, I was kind of afraid of my resident, but then they become a part of my life, you know? And as much as I went to school and got a degree and stuff, I still stuck there because I, know I felt comfortable and I care for them, you know? You, you know, even though it's a job, you, you feel a, a sort of love towards them. I just have a special love for the elderly then. This is, this is just me. And um, I guess I never regretted it. Everyone kept saying, you know, why are you still here? But it's just something I enjoy doing. And, you know, I will continue until sometime in the near future when I, I intend to retire soon. <laughs> and I did take care of um, your mom. Yes, you did. Yes. And I remember you. You were very nice. And mm. I always remember you. And everyone else you know, who's been kind and, you know, supportive. And I guess this is my word. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are so glad that you've been there for 40 years. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to do a picture real fast. Thank you again. I didn't think that that was going to be that hard, but we can now go to public comment. And we would begin with um, Frank Shiro. Is Frank? Uh, OK. Um, uh, Mandy Powell. Is Mandy not here either? Okay. Um, Andy Warren, I know you're here. <laughs> morning, Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> my question this morning is for item 10A. When you all took office the first time, um, there was quite a to-do about 
impacts on the solicitor's office and the upgrades and so on and so forth and the way that you <clears throat> were going to change things. <clears throat> and I don't have it with me today, but I, you can bet I'll have it the next time. Um, <clears throat> there was a list of salaries or payments that so outside solicitors were going to be capped at. And I, as I say, um, $350 an hour seemed to me to not be on that list at the time. Now, and I will get my notes from the original five years ago, but have we upgraded the amount that we're paying outside solicitors since the um, explanation of our step forward by reducing this, the solicitor staff. So is this 350 an hour a preview of things to come? Is it a one-off? Um, what's the issue with that? Thank you. Ed Mackhouse. Ed Mackhouse, uh, Buckingham, former teacher, scientist, engineer. And I'd like to speak about the misuse of science. Science being used to destroy America and the world, not to make it better. The fighting carbon capture pipelines, stopping environmental idiocracy. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, October 4th, signed an executive order, regional green grass regional green greenhouse gas initiative, carbon capture. These carbon capture pipelines are ridiculous. The drive to build these, these destructive, useless pipelines is ludicrous. Pipelines, they have this $1.2 trillion for this Build Back America, which is, causes these people to destroy the pipelines. The premise, carbon dioxide, the people that go to Congress don't even know what carbon dioxide is. Carbon dioxide is an essential for life. Carbon dioxide, the plants take in the carbon dioxide and produce oxygen, which we need. The increase in carbon dioxide resulting in a 40% increase in food production. So there is no harm in having all this carbon dioxide. The natural gas is the cleanest thing. Uh, Presently, the, the first president, Trump, with his energy production, made, made America energy independent. Under Jimmy Carter, we had uh, interest rates started rising, went up to 18%. We had uh, days of people fighting over getting gasoline at the pumps. So now, under President Trump, we became energy independent. Now, under Biden, he cut our or so we needed to beg our enemies to bring, give us gasoline. So this is what financed the war in uh, Ukraine for the Russians. The science, also these vaccines and other stuff is causing more problems. It's, and the Millers, the farm and the Amish people, they, they uh, don't get this autism and stuff due to the misuse of science with this uh, vaccines and stuff, which is pushing. So we got to go back and use science to understand the limitations of science. No one can calculate the effects of these vaccines on people. They use statistics, and they're misusing statistics. They use emergency decrees. If you, if you look at it, the death rates and the harm from the vaccines, the, especially this COVID vaccines, greatly exceeds any benefits. Thank you very much. Jeff Glauber. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jeff Glauber, an 18 year resident of Buckingham Township. What I'm saying, uh, speaking to you today, is directed specifically at Gene DiGirolamo, Commissioner. I live near land that you own in Buckingham Township, and I represent the group No Buckingham Warehouse. We know that you're 50% owner of this land, large tract, 
along with your uncle, Mayor Joseph DiGirolamo of Ben Salem and his wife, Mary. Your submitted development plans for your land call for the construction of a 150,000 square foot distribution center with 30 cross, cross dock truck bays and an expected 90 18 wheeler truck trips per day. Your proposal is unsafe and inappropriate for the small roads that surround your land. Never mind the countless number of homes that will be built far too close to. It will destroy our neighborhoods and create a significant road safety risk to residents. In your November 2, 2003 patch.com candidate profile, you, Eugene DiGirolamo, stated you were running for re-election and I quote, keeping Bucks County a wonderful, wonderful place to live, work, and raise our families is and always will be my high, highest priority. We can do this in many ways, including preserving our open space, farmland, making sure that the services the county provides are nothing short of exceptional, and protecting our most vulnerable citizens. The specific type of development that you're proposing here is in direct conflict to your stated position. While yes, your land is zoned industrial, PI2, planned industrial two, the specific plan that you have presented to the town of Buckingham to develop your land is unacceptable to Buckingham and surrounding neighbors and residents. We have filled the Buckingham Town Hall with those in opposition and are prepared to continue to do so. As stated, we are not questioning the zoning designation. We ask at the same time that you immediately withdraw the specific end use from consideration. Within this classification of zoning, there are plenty of options, okay, from office park, outpatient surgical facility, research park, medical offices, countless others, acceptable uses that would not receive the opposition from neighbors. We have sent you a letter on March 29, 2024, along with a follow-up in the last couple of weeks. We requested an in-person meeting. Those outreaches have gone unresponded to. Will you accept a meeting to hear resident and constituent concerns about your proposal? And if not, why not? There are quite a few people here behind me today that also share my concern, um, and there are thousands of others in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Johnson. My name is Susan Johnson, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today and talk with you. Um, I live in Central Bucks County, and I came here today to talk about the proposed industrial warehouse project. The burden, both environmental and financial, this warehouse will project will put on the backs of Buckingham and Plumstead citizens is heavy very heavy. In addition, this project will generate major safety issues. Although the township will have final say on this project, I believe this is also a county issue because number one, the county planning department will be involved in reviewing this project for compliance with county rules. And number two, a county commissioner is intimately involved in this project as he is the seller of the land. A county commissioner wields considerable power in this environment, both public and private power. Therefore, it would seem reasonable to expect this county commissioner to engage in dialogue with interested constituents. It would be respectful. Thank you. Joanne Amorosa. Could you, Joanne Amorosa. Good morning, my name is Joanne Amoroso. I am a 24 year resident of Buckingham Township. And I'd like to address Mr. Gene D. Girolamo. 
Mr. DiGeralmo. In 2019, on the website Conservation Voters of PA, Conservation Org, or PA, sorry, ConservationPA.org, your platform stated, Jean has committed to preserving farmland, encouraging renewable energy, and eliminating plastic checkout bags if he's elected, if he's elected to the county commissioner. On January 3rd, 2020, a phillyburbs.com interview regarding casting votes in legislature, Mr. Geromolo said, I always thought your conscience was the most important thing. November 2nd, 2023, in the patch, when asked, why are you running for office? Dean, Jean DiGeromolo stated, we are so fortunate to call Bucks County our home. Keeping Bucks County a wonderful place to live, work, and raise our families is and always will be my highest priority. We can do this in many ways, including preservation of our open space and farmland and making sure that the services the county provides are nothing short of exceptional and protecting our most vulnerable citizens. Mr. D. Geralmo further stated that the ability to find common ground without compromising my core principles allowed me to deliver real results. So I stand before you now, Mr. D. Geralmo, and ask what happened to your conscience, your concerns, and your principles regarding the proposed 150,000 square foot warehouse in Buckingham Township and the DiGeromolo track that you own along with your uncle, the mayor of Ben Salem. Did you forget your pledge to keep your constituents safe? Or are you exempt from these ideals you can campaigned on because $5.5 million in your pocket is more important than the promises you made as a community? Thank you. Audrey Strzok. Audrey Strine. Hello, my name is Audrey Strine. I'm from Warwick Township. Uh, I'd like to speak about the topic of David Brea um, being hired for the director of the uh, Bucks County Board of Elections. I recall about a decade ago, Republican having to resign that worked at the courthouse due to working on behalf of other campaigns. A goose and gander comes to mind for this situation. David Brea is a radical left-wing activist. He's definitely not part of, nonpartisan. This is a nonpartisan, unbiased position. Uh, this year in 2024 is going to be the most legal, contentious uh, campaign or election that we've ever seen. He did not apply. He was not interviewed. Uh, you know, we need to, you know, given her perspective, we need to look at the voters of this county and America as Americans, not by gender or color. You know, as typically Republicans are called the dividers. I see the Democrats chronically being dividers, basing people's character on, not their character, but on their color of their skin and their gender. Um, they, through virtual signaling and, and again, race and gender. Um, Hiring David Bria is a danger to the electoral system in Bucks County and would be bad for all. Uh, there was three other people that interviewed that have administrative experience in this field who would be most appropriate. Um, many people would maybe like to be in the position, but they are not, they are activists. They have been campaigning. And David Bria has been, let me get my, campaigning and hosting a fundraiser for congressional candidates, outwardly campaigning for candidates and outwardly campaigning against candidates. This is not somebody we want for this position, no matter if you're independent, Republican, or Democrat. Uh, please consider my com concerns, and this goes for hundreds and hundreds of other people in this county. I thank you for your time. Beth Curcio. Beth 
Curcio, Warminster. Mr. Harvey, unless you were referring to Donald Trump's term, we were number one to export oil when gas was under $2. Under the uniparty communist regime, we are number four and falling fast. Helping the communist regime, which hijacked our government in 2020, you hurt the people of Bucks County and PA. Destroying the oil industry and replacing it with the Green New Scam has hurt PA in many ways. Loss of jobs have been incredible. But what do you care? Your paycheck on the taxpayers' backs comes in no matter what. Do you realize that this lawsuit will only help uh, further our enemies like Iran, who has used the money to hurt Israel and the United States? They have killed over 1,000 of our servicemen and women, but what do you care? I assume that you and Diane have ordered your electric cars and stoves. I wonder when the county commissioners will represent the taxpayers of Bucks County and offer town halls so that the citizens can be part of the process in our, in our county. I looked up the, committee's, uh, the commissioner's duties, and they are to approve budgets, oversee spending, and hire county employees. I didn't see anywhere that they were to take orders from the governor to mass children, um, to shut down schools and businesses, to mandate experimental jabs on all employees. Do you realize only three counties out of 67 counties in PA mandated an experimental treatment? You may ask, why do I keep bringing this thing up? because our county has been hijacked with stolen elections and PA has one of the most corrupt. Every time you turn around, Josh Shapiro is enacting something new. Everyone should take the time to watch the free movie, Let My People Go. The machines and the polling pads are connected to the internet. Sooner or later you will be caught and it's a crime no matter how you slice it. My concern here on the local level is the lawfare that has already started by suing soccer moms. Why are the county commissioners using taxpayer funds to hire three lawyers to sue Jamie Walker? Have they ever paid the $1,500 fines? If the employees of Bucks County continue to support lawfare like this one, this, one day they will be on the other end. Many innocent people are in jail today because of the lawfare. Pro-life praying grandmoms are in prison as we speak. Mark Halk, a Bucks County father of seven who spends his life helping young children in need and his, his home was surrounded at wee hours of the morning by many FBI agents pointing military weapons at his entire family. Then they shackled him like a terrorist and threw him into the paddy wagon. Can you imagine the mental trauma on Mark's wife and children? JC's six people carrying flags are in prison with no trials. They were carrying flags and most were led into the Capitol. They had no weapons. This is total tyranny. No regard for the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Unlike Antifa and Black Lives Matters, which are both Marxist organizations, they get to burn down cities and assault people, and that's just fine. Robert McLean. Robert McLean, you can come up. Robert McLean, Milford Township. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the first responders. Appreciate that recognition of them. I'd also like to thank the recorder of deeds and the Landex system. That sort of obviates the need for title lock, I think, if I have a grasp of that. Uh, but I would like to continue my series on the biblical concept of protecting human life, in which I previously addressed capital punishment. I will now address the topic of self-defense both being enshrined in our federal and PA constitutions and laws. In Matthew 5.39, Jesus says, but if anyone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other also. Does this mean I should never defend myself from an attack? To the contrary, I have a right to protect my life and the lives of others. The context of Matthew 5.39, turning the other cheek, is how do I react to someone persecuting me as a Christian? If a criminal attacks me, whose aggression has nothing to do with opposing my Christian convictions, I have every right to defend myself, de-escalate the situation using only the force necessary to render the least harm to the attacker, regrettably, at times lethal. Proverbs 25:26 says, like a muddied spring or polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. As pertaining to defending others, Psalm 82:34, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, 
Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Uh, pertaining to uh, being armed, Luke 22, 36 through 38, Jesus said, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Money bag, knapsack, and sword are literal terms in this context and not metaphorical. Our present day sword for self-defense is a firearm. Consequently, per our second amendment and Pennsylvania constitution, we have the right to possess a firearm. The right to bear arms in the Pennsylvania Constitution. The right of the citizen to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. Recently, Australia, one of the most gun-controlled nations, has experienced mass murders and attacks using knives. Whatever weapon may be used, it is the heart of man that is evil and not the weapon. Ruth Michener. Uh, good morning. I have a question about 5A. Ms. Ms. Michener, can you pull that microphone down a little bit? Yeah. Just pull. Would you? We're one of the two. Yes. <laughs> so, question about 5A um, to approve donation to the county of unclaimed funds from unclaimed decedents held for over one year. I'm not sure what that means, and I'm wondering how that might be coordinated with the Pennsylvania Treasury and unclaimed uh, property, if at all. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the public comment. I'm going to ask our solicitor to answer both questions. That one, which is following a state law, as well as Mr. Warren's question. Sure. I'll take Mr. Warren's question first. Uh, Mr. Warren, as you may be aware, the commissioners previously approved uh, both a list of law firms that they occasionally add law firms to, and then also approved hourly rates for very specific type of yeah. types of legal work. Fortunately, the county doesn't routinely uh, enter into bankruptcy matters or have occasion to do so, but the county uh, is occasionally a party in bankruptcy tangentially, meaning they're owed property or money, um, or perhaps owe money to a vendor who has declared bankruptcy. So the purpose of this resolution, 10A, is simply to approve a maximum rate for bankruptcy work should the county ever need to engage a bankruptcy work, uh, attorney, which is much more cost effective than us having a full-time bankruptcy attorney sitting around. For purposes of the coroner question, um, although um, neither the coroner nor uh, her solicitor, I understand that uh, public approval here is needed um, where there has been unclaimed funds that really can't find um, a person that they need to go back to. So you imagine a scenario where somebody doesn't have decedents or known relatives, or where those relatives aren't interested in receiving those funds. Uh, this is a mechanism um, that's permitted under the code to allow for that those funds to go somewhere rather than sitting in, in the coroner's department. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, we will make donations to three charities as a result of, of that. And I think there, there's like a one year or five year, I forget, there's a limitation how long the coroner has to hold that money. So it's totally different than the treasuries that you were talking about. And Commissioner, did you want to? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a few comments about the farm in Buckingham. Um, There's not a whole lot I can say because the property is under agreement of sale. But I would like to make a, a few comments about my family. When I was sworn in back here at the beginning of January, um, much of my comments focused on my, uh, my grandfather who immigrated over here to America back in 1912, uh, landed in Philadelphia, 
settled there. My grandmother, whose maiden name was Formica, uh, also came over the same year. And they ended up getting married in 1920. Uh, my grandfather started working on a farm in Northeast Philadelphia. My dad was born shortly after they got married. Uh, they moved to a small piece of property in the early 1920s on the grounds where Holy Family University is in Northeast Philly. There's a little road in the back there, it's called Stevenson Lane. And there was a little, very little, as I was told, house, and they rented the property, and my grandfather started farming. About the mid-1920s, he moved to a farm, if you can believe it, and again, he didn't have enough money to buy it. He rented it, it was on um, the Roosevelt Boulevard and Grand Avenue, if you can imagine a farm being there. And again, him and my grandmother uh, farmed the ground. They, they made a living, barely, from what I was told. And then the Depression hit, 1929, which was a hard time for everyone. Farming at that time happened to be something that was good to be in. So my grandfather was able to save enough money because people had to eat and the crops he was growing were bringing good money. And he bought in the early 1930s, he put a deposit down on a farm in Ben Salem, right along the Delaware River on Dunks Ferry Road. It's actually right across the street from the, uh, the Chamonix State Park. It was a farm of about 25 acres, and uh, him and my uncle, some other family members, uh, built a very nice house on the property right on the river. Uh, the house is still there today. It, it's part of, a, part of a business. I was born, I, when my parents got married in 1949, I was born in 1950, and we moved into the house with my grandparents. And the crops that we grew back then were much the same as the crops that we grew when we were farming years later. I and mean, it was all vegetable crops like spinach and cabbage and parsley and parsnips and turnips. Uh, those are the crops that we grew. The, the one, one thing that I remember when I was a little boy, uh, during the winter, we struggled a lot because there was no income coming in from the farm. Uh, I can remember my grandfather, my, my dad, getting in, and we had one truck at that time, and he would drive up to the upper part of the county, Upper Bucks. I went with him a couple times. And he would go to the chicken farms and load chicken manure fold the truck up with chicken manure and bring it back to our farm because chicken manure was really, really good fertilizer. And he would bring it back and the next day he would shovel the chicken manure on wagons. I couldn't help him, I wanted to help, but I was just, just too small. And then he'd spend that day out and go spread the chicken manure out in the fields for the coming spring because it was really good fertilizer and plus it saved a lot of money. And then the next day he would go back up in the upper part of the county and do the same thing again. In 1970, my grandfather sold that farm and we moved to another farm on Humeville Road in Ben Salem. Uh, we continued to grow. We opened a, a farm market there and sold a lot of the produce that we grew on the farm in the farm market. And we started to expand and get a little bit bigger. And the farm in Buckingham, I mean, we had, we had bought another farm first on Mechanicsville Road. Uh, but the farm that you're talking about in Buckingham, I think we purchased in the early 1980s. So it's, it's been, been over 40 years. I think I see you shaking your head. I'm not quite sure what, what year that was. And, and, and 
we worked that farm and we grew, and at that time we were farming about 500 acres. And those 500 acres were a lot more than 500 acres because much of the, the crops that we grew, we doubled and triple cropped. And none of it was harvested by machine. It was all hand harvested. I mean, spinach, we grew a lot of kale as well, the cabbage, you, you had to go out into the field actually and we, we had these, we, these knives and you would cut the vegetables with the knives and then we would bring it back to our, our, our pack house in Ben Salem and ice it and wash it down and ship it to the markets, mainly in Philadelphia. Uh, we went a lot up to Hunts Point, sold a lot of produce down in Vineland, New Jersey, which is one of the biggest, and I still think today, hubs for vegetables for the East Coast. And we worked really hard, seven days a week. Most of the time, 10, 12, 14 hours a day we worked. And there just came a time when the stuff we were growing, the price for it was going down. There wasn't a really market for a lot of those fresh vegetables anymore and what we could grow. And so the family had to make a decision on whether we were going to continue farming or not. And that was about 25 years ago, I guess, or so. And we decided to stop farming. We kept the road stand. And since that time, uh, we've been renting the farm out, as probably you all know, to, to another farmer who has uh, continued to farm it. I, I, I just thought it was important for you to know that and, uh, about my family. I'm very proud of my family. Um, I, I, maybe that's not going to make a difference to you. And again, I, I can't really talk about what's going on with the farm because of the agreement of sale. Uh, but I, I was important for me to let you know that about my family. So that's all I'd like to say, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So moving to the consent agenda, I am looking for a motion to approve the minutes from the April 3rd, 2024 meeting, as well as resolutions 1 through 16A. So is, there, moved. is there a second? Second. All in favor? Oh, sorry. sorry, before you You're vote, I right. uh, just wanted to note for the record that 15A and 15B um, are going on subject to solicitor approval, which I've already spoken to the sheriff about and uh, anticipate solicitor approval is forthcoming by the end of the week. Thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, so there's a motion. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we'll move to the regular agenda. Um, first, we have general services, and I'm George Hutt. Bernard, are you explaining, do you want to start, Margie? I, I will start just, okay. just by saying thank you to all the participants for this project. It's a, this, uh, these um, requests, 17A, B, C, D, and E, represent about 19 point, a little over $19.8 million for the Lower Bucks Government Services Center. That's going to be about 30, 39,000 square feet of space. Um, that is, I would say, th 33,000 more square feet of space than we currently have in the Lower Bucks Government Services Center. It is gonna bring in, uh, how many departments? 13 departments. Um, and those, uh, some of those agencies have lease space in Lower Bucks County that we'll be bringing into this, to this, this agency, or into this building. And I will turn it over to George to, to finish. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, so exciting times in, uh, in our world at General Services. We have a lot going on, and uh, we have a lot of time and energy put into this project. And I'm proud to say that we're, we're very close to getting it started and getting going. It's, uh, it's been a long time since something's been down at the lower end of the county at, at this capacity, and this building's going to serve the constituents of the, all the county very well. And it's a, it's a beautiful building that's rendering some of the pictures are being th shown on the video now so um, the site is just outside the uh, the footprint of the old Thiokol buildings and um, so everything's that's going on is uh, going to be repurposed through what the uh, Erdrick McHen McHenry had uh, put put together for for us here um, 
So you'll be walking up to the front entrance here, and as you walk in, there's a there's like a grand entrance with um, a big escalated stairs coming in for like community people to. It's like a gathering space where you can sit and and uh, it'll have full Wi-Fi and everything else. It's a state-of-the-art building, and uh, it's going to consolidate a lot of our services. It's going to help the sheriff out down there for, with new facilities for him. Um, it's also going to help with uh, the career link, health department. Um, I think it's 13 of them. I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but uh, um, it's it, the building itself is pretty incredible, and, and we're very proud of it, and we're really looking forward to getting it started and getting getting it up and running for the community and the people of Bucks County. Um, I'm open to any questions if anybody has anything. I don't. I, I would. I will just add um, a couple couple of uh, notes here. A lot of time and effort went into getting to this point of getting uh, these contractors and the bids out, um, reviewing the bids. I want to say thank you to Bernard Griggs for his help, um, and also Mike Connolly for coordinating this effort from General Services, and Liz Gates, Liz Gates. from purchasing to keeping us all on track. <laughs> so thank you to, to the three, and Gail Humphrey uh, for also keeping, keeping us going. I see you under there. This, thank you. This was definitely a, a team effort from just about every department. Yes. Uh, it's it's uh, something that we're going to be very proud of for a long time. Yes. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments, commissioners? Just uh, echo the thanks. Uh, it has been really one of the first things we came in, you know, talking actually in 2019, talking about the fact that the Lower Bucks Government Services Center really was very inadequate for the needs of the people of this county in terms of what they should be able to do there. Um, you know, Doylestown is lovely, but it's not always the easiest place to get to uh, if you have to do business. Uh, and so if we can have more um, of our offices having space in the lower end uh, at this building, certainly that makes, uh, that makes a world of difference. Just a little bit, uh, if you're looking sort of architecturally speaking, we think about Lower Bucks County, we think about the growth of Lower Bucks County, we tie that really to two things, a couple things. Uh, the steel mill, which was built in the 50s, and the growth of Levittown, uh, also in the 50s. You'll notice the steel you know, exterior of this building, which is connection to that. Uh, you'll also notice some of the rectangular windows, which is anybody who knows Levittown knows that a lot of the, a lot of the windows in Levittown, the Levittown houses have just the rectangular windows. So you see that uh, connection as well, just a little bit of a, of a nod to the past of this area as we, as we build for the future. So, um, you know, I um, want to definitely thank Marjorie Kevitt as well. I mean, she mentioned all the people who were involved here. Uh, you know, Gail Humphrey was, was a driving force in this for a long time. Uh, and continues to be. Um, you know, Bernard Griggs and, and George Hutt coming on and Mike Connolly coming on the past couple of years or year or so. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, Ms. McKevitt also having some input, a lot of input, I should say, uh, in, in what this would look like. And uh, um, the different offices, we reached out to the offices that will be here, including some of the raw offices, getting their input about what they would like to see in, in spaces, uh, you know, that are going to be in this building. So, yeah, I'm excited to move forward. So, thank you. Me too. Thank you. This is at five points in Levittown where the current Government Services Center is. Um, is there any, any questions? Right is there a motion to approve item number 17, A through E? So moved. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have some budget adjustments today. All right, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your consideration. Two budget adjustments for two, 2024. Adjustment number 22, or adjustment number two, refers to um, items 15 A, B, and C that were just approved on the consent agenda. That would allow for the recognition of the federal grant revenue and the expenses associated with that grant. Um, adjustment number three um, would allow for the uh, expense of additional um, insurance premiums for 2024. Uh, with the adoption of the 24 budget um, and the adjustment today, the insurance premiums, the total complement of insurance premiums that will cover all the county's assets and operations 
um, will be a total of $275,000 more than 2020-2023. So this budget adjustment will allow for um, the payment of all of the premiums for 2024. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Is there a motion to adopt the personnel actions for today? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have two Boyd appointments today. Commissioner Harvey, do you want to do those? Sure. We um, <clears throat> recently, the Buck County Human Relations Council um, saw uh, that the chair, Mr. Bernard Hoffman, longtime member, stepped down. We thank him for his service uh, to fill the remainder of his role. Uh, Mr. Vitaly Velenchuk um, is uh, somebody who will be appointed, um, make a motion rather, for him to be appointed for a term that will end August 1st, 2025. For the Bucks County Mental Health Development Advisor, Developmental Programs Advisory Board is a three-year term. This is a new appointment, Mr. Michael Tavar. His term will end April 20th, 2027. I'll make a motion for both of those appointments. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. For other civics, we have two. For the Bucks County Community College Veterans Club, $1,500. And for the Bucks County Health Improvement Partnership, $2,500. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Chief Operating Officer's report. Thank you, Commissioner. I um, have two items to report on today, and I'm going to ask Neil Dougherty, our Director of Sustainability, and Cassandra Good Goodmanson to come to the podium to talk about our sustainability plan for the County of Bucks operations. Thank you, commissioners. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. In recognition of Earth Day on this coming Monday, April 22nd, we would like to present our sustainability plan for Bucks County government operations. This sustainability plan represents a promise kept dating back to the 2020 transition plan, which was developed by a panel of experts, leaders, and constituents for what at the time was a new administration. They called for a sustainability plan for county operations. The recently adopted Bucks County comprehensive plan, the 2040 plan, is uh, engaging and compelling. So we followed that as our template for our sustainability plan. While the 2040 comprehensive plan is an outward looking document for the county and municipalities, this sustainability plan focuses internally on county government operations, facilities, workforce, and practices. But like the Bucks 2040 comprehensive plan, this sustainability plan is a living implementable document one that our team will continue to work on and refine even as we pursue goals and strategies. I want to thank Evan Stone, the Executive Director of the Bucks County Planning Commission for his guidance and patience and leadership. I'd like to thank Michael Reddig, Senior Planner, for his expertise and insight. I'd like to thank Lynn Lai and Jeremy Stoff, who've been invaluable for layout and design. Uh, they have skills that I envy. And um, I also want to thank the LCAP team. We did the local climate action program from 22 to 23, and that really served as a playbook for developing our sustainability plan. And most of all, I want to thank our environmental planner, Cassandra Goodmanson, who is largely responsible for crafting this plan. Next slide, please. Sustainability. Sustainability refers to mitigating our negative actions through the management of county buildings, energy, vehicle fleet, landscapes, procurement, and workforce in a way that, one, protects clean air and water by reducing emissions and establishing healthy and functioning ecosystems, two, improves efficiency, communication, and cohesion within and between departments, and fosters intentionality with strategic planning. And three, builds a sense of equity and community among our employees and improves safety and preparedness. Next slide, please. Our sustainability plan is broken up into five sectors as developed during our LCAP or Local Climate Action Plan process. They are energy and buildings, transportation, landscapes and natural resources, purchasing, material management, and workforce and collaboration. 
Within this document, we have a total of 15 goals and 86 strategies. This, these strategies were developed by meeting with department heads and other staff, as well as through conducting a sustainability survey which was distributed to all employees for their input from which we received nearly 300 responses. Next slide. For each goal, we have identified and listed multiple strategies. So we have a strategy and a timeline. We have metrics to measure progress towards achieving and attaining that goal. And then we've identified a project lead who is responsible for working with us to helping make that goal happen. We also have identified three time periods for delivering strategies. One to three is the near term, three to five is the midterm, and five years and beyond is the long term. Since this is the first county operations sustainability plan, it is heavy with near-term attainable targets and strategies in the one to three year period. Next slide, please. I will now go through each sector and give an example of one goal. For our first, um, oh, as well as um, for this first goal, I will be also be showing a strategy so you can see our template. Our first sector is energy and buildings. One of our goals is to reduce county operations energy demand. This will not only reduce pollution, but will save taxpayer money. Next slide, please. Our second sector is transportation, with one of our goals to be reduced transportation emissions and air pollution. A third sector is landscapes and natural resources with a goal to make outdoor spaces have a high use, uh, value use for people. Next slide. Our fourth sector is purchasing material management with a goal to purchase products that are grown or made locally. And our fifth and final sector is workforce and collaboration with one of our goals being to develop a culture of sustainability among county employees. We find this goal particularly vital as these goals and strategies cannot be accomplished without the buy-in of our employees. Next slide. Commissioners and Madam Chair, I want to bring your attention to a timeline for when this work really began in earnest. If you look at 2020, that's when the transition report was produced for what was then the new administration. In 2021, this Board of Commissioners unanimously approved Ready for 100, which calls for 100% renewable electricity for government, county government operations by 2035. In 2022, you on onboarded the Director of Sustainability in the Bucks County Planning Commission. What's missing there is you also added an environmental planner that same year who has been essential to our work. In 22 and 23, we completed the LCAP, the Local Climate Action Plan or program. We did that with the, in cooperation with the DEP and Penn State University. Most notable in 23, and I think it was October, we formed and joined the Sustainable Energy Partnership with our neighboring counties of Montgomery, Chester, and Delaware. That is going to allow us to access the wholesale energy market and procure renewable electricity for county operations. And quite honestly, the way you're gonna achieve Ready for 100 in 2021 is that Sustainable Energy Partnership, which was formed in 23. Earlier this year, the Bucks County Planning Commission uh, presented to you and you approved or adopted the Bucks County 2040 plan that really served as a guidepost for us and they directed a lot of issues head on of which we're very proud. It also provided the template for this document. Recently, Cassandra and I wrapped up the SolSmart designation for Bucks County, which we had been working on for nearly two years. We really haven't had time to bring this to your attention because we have been working so hard um, trying to uh, wrap up some grants and then also in the spring of 24 we were trying to meet our deadline to deliver the sustainability plan for you at this time next slide please so again thank you and have a happy earth day on monday um, we are going to be posting the sustainability plan on the bucks county planning commission website under the sustainability page and now our work begins where we partner with departments and work through the goals and strategies for our, for our sustainability plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair.
No, I just want, I just want to thank you both. You know, tremendous amount of work, Mr. Stone as well for, for you know, you know him, uh, you know, being all on board with this. This was not a, a really didn't have to do a lot of convincing when we said, hey, we, we want to have this, this position, these two positions, and, and uh, it's something that the Planning Commission really jumped on board with. So really thank you all uh, for your work. It's, it's exciting. I've talked about peop to people about this. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, other elected officials, local elected officials, who want to know how they can get involved. How do, we get, how do they apply this to their townships? How do they apply this to their boroughs or school districts, things like that? Um, and it is about a, it's a culture change, essentially, uh, in terms of how do we take the normal processes and, and practices we have as a county and how do we start change as, as an integral organization, how do we change them so that we're using less energy, we're using less paper, we're using different ways uh, to do the same job that is, as you said, is going to save people money, uh, the taxpayers, uh, you know, and it's going to allow us to be more forward looking rather than past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and secondly, if I could invite uh, Diane Rosati, the Executive Director of the Bucks County Drug and Alcohol, to talk about Drug Take Back Day, which is April 27th. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined today by our Prevention Supervisor, Mallory Parati, and want to begin by just announcing that our next Take Back is Saturday, April 27th. It's the medication Take Back, so what a nice segue from Earth Day to the medication take back because there certainly is an impact on our environment. Um, before I hand this over to Mallory, um, and then she'll hand it back to me briefly, um, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for your support every day, ongoingly, and especially on this particular project, which we believe is one of the most highly successful projects, not just in Bucks County, but statewide. So we thank you for your leadership and your support, and a special thanks to Rachel Neff for her leadership within the Division of, of Human Services. Um, this is a collaborative project uh, in our department. It is managed by Mallory and another prevention specialist on staff, Lauren Foisey, and a large committee of community folks who contribute to the project. Special thanks, of course, to the District Attorney's Office and all of law enforcement um, and community residents. So I'm gonna turn this over to Mallory, who'll give you a little bit of detail, and then she'll turn it back to me. Thank you. And as Diane said, this project would not be as successful in Bucks County without the support of county leadership, law enforcement, and our Take Back Committee, which meets throughout the year, which includes community coalitions, children and youth, and the Area Agency on Aging. Um, so as Diane said, uh, Take Back Day is Saturday, April 27th from 10 to 2. We have 47 public collection sites. Many are at local police departments, grocery stores, and a few hospitals as well. Um, you'll also notice that we have 30 sites where we're collecting sharps. So this is a project that started a few years ago at just six sites, and now we have 30 sites participating, which is great. Um, on the back, um, on the table, you'll, you'll find a flyer with all of our locations listed, as well as our uh, Take Back brochure, which includes a listing of all the permanent medication boxes. Residents can go year-round, not just the, on these two days a year. Um, again, many are at local police departments. Um, and we also have Narcan kits and Deterra bags available. So as we get closer, we're about 10 days away from launch of the project. And so what you see is the incredible success that we've had throughout the duration of the project since 2010. We've collected over 211,000 pounds of medication, which is just incredible. Uh, we've collected over 3,000 pounds of sharps, and that is just a recent occurrence for us. So we know the need is great. We want to help folks to understand how they can remove medications, unwanted medications from their homes. Um, and we believe it's an important prevention effort and environmental effort for the community. So we thank everyone. One of the ways that we announce this event is through social media, and we thank the county very much for helping us in that endeavor. Wanted to take a moment today to just share with you our most recent posting, and I believe Randy has our video for you to share. Sharks, head meds, and face that's the plan. Drive on up 
Well, thanks to Bethany Pacheski on our team. That is her incredible voice that I know you've heard before. We're really grateful for her having written the lyrics. Uh, but the melody, of course, we owe to Lin-Manuel Miranda from Hamilton, and, and thanks to him as well. Uh, but before we close, just wanted to thank all the community residents out there who understand how important it is to remove medications, um, all types of medications, including pet medications and vapes from their homes. Um, we're only as good as the community that supports us, and we have a fantastic community that understands how important this is. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Solicitor's report. Thank you, Commissioner. Just one item to report. Uh, the board held its standing executive session yesterday, April 16th, with staff and legal counsel present to discuss personnel matters pending a prospective litigation and to receive confidential legal advice. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner comments. Commissioner DiGirolamo? No, no further comments, Madam Chair. Commissioner Harvey? <clears throat> yeah, just uh, as we said, we have uh, a major project, uh, the biggest one certainly in the past four years, construction project. Uh, which we just approved uh, the contractors on. And uh, we had a little bit of a, a breaking ground ceremony several months ago. So looking forward to the act going out and seeing that ground actually getting broken up and some work being done. Um, so, uh, you know, looking forward to that. So thank you again for everybody who did that work. Uh, to our planning commission for all the work they did on the sustainability plan, drug and alcohol commission. Thank you for the work you do all the time. Um, yeah, Earth Day, as you, as you heard, is coming up. <clears throat> um, you know, I remember, you know, the, the progress that we've made over the past 50-some years since the first Earth Day, I think sometimes it gets lost. Um, you know, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Nature Species Act, all laws passed uh, more than 50 years ago uh, have had a sizable impact. Um, you know, Commissioner Deidre Alamo mentioned, you know, growing up uh, as a kid, and I grew up in Lower Bucks County as well, born and raised here, and my grandfather used to take me out on his little 16-foot boat. Um, and there used to be a boat ramp in Bristol Borough, so he'd take us out, or take me out, I should say, when I was a little kid, like elementary school age. And I remember vividly we'd go out on summer days, and then I, you know, and he'd take me out fishing. And uh, I remember asking one time um, why we were using fishing poles, because there were all these fish floating on top of the river. Why didn't we just use the net and scoop them up? Um, and because that was the Delaware, you know, for a long time. It was a, a river that was pretty heavily polluted. Um, and so it was, a, you know, it, that has changed um, just as the efforts of, uh, you know, the federal, state, local governments um, and all the many, many uh, nonprofits that focus on protecting our environment have done a tremendous amount of work over the past few decades. Um, <clears throat> and so whatever you do this uh, over the next uh, week or so, 10 days, I know there's different Earth Day things, some of this weekend, some of the weekend following. Um, thank you for whatever it is. If you're picking up litter, if you're just planting flowers or planting a tree in your yard or helping out a neighbor or whatever you're doing, I'm sure Commissioner uh, Marsegla will be cutting grass a couple times in the pe next 10 days because that's her thing. Um, but um, <clears throat> appreciate that. Um, and I know obviously there are you know, some more commentary about the, uh, the climate suit um, you know, and it's just some statistics I, you know, was looking up uh, just yesterday, actually, uh, just to give an idea about, um, you know, the oil industry, I guess, in general. But um, as of yesterday, the bar a barrel of oil was $13 cheaper than it was two years ago. Okay. Um, problem is that two years ago, gas was the same price as it is now. Uh, and so... Ask yourself if the oil industry is paying $13 less a barrel, where's the reflection in the price we pay at the pump? Um, the problem is, uh, um, well, the situation really is you have oil companies that have figured out how much people will be willing to pay 
uh, for a gallon of gas, and they're going to go to the maximum, which is capitalism. That's fine. They can do that. Um, but let's not pretend that uh, uh, or defend the oil industry and gas industry. They've, they've made a lot of money. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, sorry. We shouldn't really have people yelling out ignorantly from the crowd. Um, but, you know, it's uh, certainly as we go into the spring, we can take a, a long, deeper breath than we could 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. We can enjoy cleaner water than we had decades ago. Uh, and I'm glad that we can keep uh, taking steps to make it even better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Agree. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>